When people use religion to trick, to lure, to deceive, to take advantage of, or just to harm people, this has a name. That's spiritual abuse. This episode is personal, as I've been victim of spiritual abuse in my first marriage. Through this episode, I wanted to meet with other people to try to understand and make sense of what happened. Why didn't we see the red flags? And is it possible to recover, or to heal and be back to a normal life after such an experience? And more generally, what should be the best response from the community? I do generally believe there are Muslims out there who abuse Islam and they try to use it to, for their own benefit. One of the things that they get you with from the very beginning is this idea that you are uh, going the fear of hell. So if you leave the organisation, you're going to go to hell. Some people would actually use you know, whatever um, power they have over other individuals to get what they want. Ones I've heard about, which I was quite sad, is where like abuse happened in the mosque or when uh, a child has been abused by the Quran teacher or whatever. You expect that the people of, of, of knowledge, of, of, of religion, that they would be the ones who would be the most trustworthy. And unfortunately, sometimes they are, but also sometimes they're not. The only way to address such serious issues is by giving the community a vocabulary and tools to understand the problem so we can collectively solve it. This is the aim of Danish Kasim, who co-founded the website in Sheikh's clothing. Using religion for dunya, that's the best really definition for it. How to harm others, um, either by physical abuse or verbal abuse, uh, taking money from people, uh, you know, getting servants, all of that would fall under spiritual abuse. You could be a volum li ghayrihi, a person can be a volum li ghayrihi, an oppressor to somebody else, or there's a volum li nafsihi, a person who harms themselves, oppresses their own selves. So all of that would go under this idea of using religion for worldly gain. Because ultimately, what is it to do with? It's to do with power, right? You have power over others in some capacity and you are abusing that power in the name of God and religion. Unless people recognise the abuse that takes place within the community, we can't then go forward. They leave massive scars on the Muslim community and we don't want the legacy of the Muslim community amongst all the other issues that we face to be that there was acts of spiritual abuse and the net effect of that in the long haul will be people will leave the deen or they'll be so traumatised that they'll just turn against their own faith or the community will implode, which is what we sometimes see. Islam is free from this. And people need to realise these are Muslims themselves who are doing it. Spiritual abuse is not always individual. For example, we can talk about people or organisations that deliver like anti-women, anti-black or anti-Shia discourses. Famous examples of spiritual abuse in the recent years have included religious scholars misconducting with women, organizations promising quick halal money and stealing thousands of pounds from people, influencers who use religion to gain fame, followers or trick people into giving zakat for a cause while they take the money for themselves. Thankfully, Muslim academics, activists and artists and social media personalities have started being vocal about it. This week, I'll be continuing with a campaign that I launched last month, stamping out spiritual abuse. And the problem with spiritual abuse is that not only it damages the image of Muslims, but it also damages the personal relationship one has with other Muslims, with Islam, with, with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala altogether. I'm a convert from the um, Hindu faith and I embraced Islam more than 20 years ago. Um, but when I embraced Islam, um, my birth family didn't accept it. And I was subjected to um, physical abuse, or as um, some people when have actually um, narrated my story, they've actually said it's not actually just physical abuse, it is actually torture. I, hadn't, I was given an ultimatum, give up Islam or get out of the house. So I had no option, I had to leave. I joined HT when I was 17. I think I was searching for 
uh, a sense of self, a sense of identity in a society which I felt largely maybe outside of. And I was always quite a politically, kind of a polit politically astute person. It was something I was always kind of interested in. Um, and it had the great mix. It had God, it had religion, it had politics, it had all of those things. And it had a mantra of saving, like saving the world. So I'm gonna kind of preface this by saying, for a long time, I didn't see there were any red flags because I was so immersed in HT. I, I also managed to kind of be elevated to kind of the upper echelons of HT. I became very senior in the party. And for a lot of the time, a lot of women, they got suspended because they had family lives and they were struggling to keep up with their family lives or maybe they were supporting their husbands. So this was one thing that because I was, you know, senior in the party myself, I was also responsible for making people's life very, very difficult and very hard because I was part of that structure and people looked up to me. When I had my conversion, I thought that was bad enough. And the way I t look at it now, to be honest, is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was, pre was preparing me for worse to come. And that was my marriage. Upon visiting like um, the in-laws, I had to sit in the back room whilst everyone else was in the front room. And that was due to segregation. Even though the men folk were sitting in the same room as the, um, um, you know, the in-laws basically. Stepchildren or all the um, nieces and nephews, they will be sent to me as a punishment if they were naughty. So they're all in the front room, but if they're misbehaving, they will be sent to me. And you know, the children themselves grow up thinking, oh, that's the evil stepfather. This in itself, they said the segregation comes from Islam, etc. But in reality, what was happening here, it wasn't segregation, it was isolation. One of the main things is, is HT, one of the things that they talk about is if you leave HT, then you are gonna die sinful. And they would publicly say that anybody who was not working for the Caliphate, the Khilafah, was uh, in sin and would die the death of Jahiliya. And when you're in the party, it's almost impossible for you to question that. I can't uh, state that enough, much like a cult, because it was almost like it was Quran and Sunnah. It was like written in stone. In my case, it didn't stop there. Um, when I had physical abuse um, from my ex, she, um, you know, she gave me bruises. There were at times, for example, when I would actually, um, when, we, uh, when we separated, when I would visit, if there was something that was um, taking place in the house, for example, a water leak, oh, I was the man of the house, what kind of a Muslim are you? You know, you should be dealing with it. Or what kind of a Muslim father are you? And on top of that, you know, because I am, uh, as I mentioned, I'm, I'm a convert to Islam, that was thrown in my face as well. Oh, you're a convert, you think you know it all. What I've seen as the most common, I guess, or close to what you're asking, is using uh, poor religious reasoning or just any opinion that exists that says this is halal. Mm. Um, so for example, verbal abuse, uh, to say that's tarbiyah, to give it a good name. And that's that's um, one of the tactics of shaitan talbis, to give something bad, to make something bad seem appear uh, appear good. These healers that we talked about. So they do everything, everything that they do, you can't pinpoint that it's explicitly haram, but they live a life of ruqsa essentially, or exploiting gray areas where the untrained person won't be able to really answer what's wrong with them. Um, another big one is really when canonical religion is put to the side in favor of dreams and visions and feelings. Because then you allow your teacher to just make their own religion essentially. And yes, we have a all that has its place in the religion, but it never overrides the Sharia. You shouldn't believe someone's a wali if they're even claiming to be and saying that being a wali entitles them to be above the Sharia and harm other people. In 2008, I got married to a wonderful person wearing the hijab, praying her five prayers, fasting on Mondays and Thursdays and doing qiyam every single night. I took these as a guarantee that I was marrying a good person, and I was completely wrong. She ended up abusing me verbally, emotionally, and physically. My marriage lasted five years, and more than eight years on, I haven't completely recovered, and I'm not sure I'll ever recover from this. Much like Sultana, I never saw it coming, never. Now I was thinking that arguments are part of a normal married life. I, I saw my parents arguing, I saw my friends' parents uh, arguing. No matter what would I have done, let me give you an example, leaving a glass uh, in the sink, that was enough for me to end up with a black eye. My ex-wife would use 
uh, her position as a born Muslim to take advantage um, of my very little knowledge of Islam to justify her actions and that to make me believe that yes abuse uh, is part of a normal Islamic marriage and I only realized years after we're talking more like that five six seven years maybe that it was abusive when she left me I think I would probably still be married to her some people have the strength to leave but then it's a very tough journey it was really 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 hard it was um it was not a decision I'd made lightly. I had, um, it was actually quite traumatic. So leaving and telling people that you're leaving, that there was a lot of shock around me leaving. So that was one element of it. I lost everybody that I'd known over the last 20 years. Now you can imagine, they become your everything. They become your support network, your friends, your everybody that you know, all the births, marriages and deaths that you attend and know happen within HT in, the, in a moment of, you know, an utterance of a, you know, this statement, I'm going to leave. Slowly, slowly, that all starts to dissipate. So it's the physicality and the knowledge that that's all gone. So you're left with just yourself. The long lengths of time that go by, I don't think about it, I'm just moving forward. But then like my off chance, there could be a trigger point. Like for example, what I made mention like last week, I, I don't know how I accidentally was um, on my computer. I came across the file, I didn't know what it was, I opened it up and I started watching the beginning two minutes and that was a, a you know like a flashback moment on that night I couldn't really sleep. Has it been hard? It's been really hard um, because I've had to get to know who I am again. I've had to get to re kind of reconfigure my faith outside of the parameters of what I knew um, and what I'd been told for 20 years of my life um, and who was I now whilst I was on the outside. As Sultana said you need to reconfigure your relationship with God. After my divorce I had to fight like a severe depression. I would pray, Allah, please bring me back to you. I don't want to be on earth anymore. And it was this five times a day during five years at least. I had some more subsequent misadventure, let's to say, with people who used my state of vulnerability. Again, under the cover of a layer of religiosity to trick me. And for example, I had someone like uh, she said she was a practicing Muslim and told me that, yeah, go and kill yourself. So how am I supposed to make sense of all this? One doesn't embrace Islam for people. But what it did is that I didn't want to be around Muslims anymore. I didn't feel safe in the UK. It's not my country. I wasn't born here. I had to like build everything from scratch and I was just I didn't want to cross the path of my abusers again. You know, you never fully recover from this kind of thing. Memories are still present. And like Abdul Malik, I still have flashes sometimes. Of course, I have become more confident about myself, what happened, uh, but at times I still feel weak. I just went um, to the NHS. I, I did see um, a domestic violence specialist and they were quite um, helpful and that was every two weeks as well and they assessed how I was progressing as well and I think for myself um, a part of that healing process has been me speaking about it. In speaking about it as healing and to get to get help because what we don't want because what can also happen is a deadly cycle of somebody that has been abused then sometimes they become the next abusers so we need to be careful about that as well they need to get that help and that support so they don't fall into that. The first signs of where that became easier is when I started to meet people who I felt an affinity to with regards to my faith um, and just as human beings um, and that was from God because it that, that process became so much easier for me to do. As a sociologist, my job is to examine and understand people's reaction. And especially, I wanted to understand why people feel so defensive whenever there's a case of abuse that happens in the community. Find them 70 excuses. Do you have four male witnesses? Are you a sheikh to talk about this? Hide the sins of your brothers and your sisters. This is a saying, it teaches in Islam that we should hide the, the sins of our brother and this is how a lot of people are getting away with it which is which is wrong we can't just 
you know, let people get away with it. And this is what's been happening. We say, oh, you know, give them excuses. So they might say, no, you are, you know, casting aspersions on your brother if you go and do this. You are creating public opinion. HT was very big on this. Don't create public opinion in the party against somebody. They used to use this language. Um, or it's, you know, it's haram to create fitna about somebody. So we use all the jargon which is surrounding it. But ultimately, what we're really saying is that this is a form of gaslighting and silencing people. If people are told that standing up for their own rights is is ego, is nafs. Anytime somebody in leadership position, even a friend, gives you advice based on what benefits them, you're being cheated. And they conflate it with Islamophobia and what have you. And I think this is another problem. There's such a conflation of these issues. And really what needs to happen is Muslims need to get our house in order in terms of these things. The one thing that that you'll notice is the money behind it. There's an economy here. And people who can perform well, who can sell seats, sell tickets and bring people in, they're the money makers and they're the big draws a lot of times. Hmm. So a lot of other people's side economies depend on this individual being present. And many of these abusive people are narcissists. They're very good at emotionally reading people. They know what people are looking for and they will bring them in. We need is for religious law like excuses being made to to be ignored by people when they see nonsense. So the example I give is a lot of you'll have, for example, uh, sometimes men touching women on their hijab, saying it's there's technically a barrier, there's a high, it's not skin to skin, so it's not haram, and you can't say it's haram. So we need uh, to encourage people to say, I don't care if it's haram, you don't touch me in that way. We should call it out. We should call it out, and also as well, we should make sure we should look for the victims. We should give the victim support because even we know, even outside of religion, for example, uh, when it comes to that, for example, like with rape and stuff, what has happened a lot of times that the women were never believed. There will always be people that will say, um, why are you calling this out for? Oh, we should get this. But actually, it's better to try to protect the, the, the innocent, try to protect the weak. Many a times they have got no one to protect them. But if you see something which you can recognise is not okay. What is it that you're doing? Account them. And I, I don't see anything wrong with doing that quite publicly, even if you feel scared to do it. The point here is, is you will feel scared to do it. Your voice will still shake when you do it. But should you do it? Yes, you should. Because once you do that, it will give other people who feel less, you know, less like they have a voice, the, the ability to see that it can be done, it has been done, and so therefore, maybe I can do it next time. And we need to create a wave of change, even that if that's one or two people. Challenge power, because isn't that what the Prophet did? He challenged power. That This is an act of faith. Rasulullah, again, he told us that if we see something bad, yeah, we should actually get with our hands and deal with it physically, move it physically. If we can't do that, then we just speak out about it. And then if we can't do that, then in our heart, we just keep it in our heart. But if we keep it in our heart, that's the weakest of faith. Sexual abuse or something like this. Definitely, this person should be handed over to the police. Um, if we don't, uh, this person will be able to um, carry on doing the same kind of abuse. You cannot look, no longer play, oh, I don't want anything to do with it because it involves the police, it involves the courts, the social services. No, if you've witnessed it, that's all you're given. What happened on that day, that time, etc. You know, be the truthful Muslim here. You're not taking sides. You just you're just going to give a witness statement. That's all it is. Whistleblowing is a religious duty in Islam. It is thanks to these whistleblowers that organizations that stole money got dismantled and their leaders arrested. Scholars who abused women have been sent to prison. Influencers who stole zakat money got caught by the charity commission. A wider question I think would be is that why don't we have support networks? Supporting somebody who's been through that, the most powerful thing that you can do is listen to them. Um, the most powerful thing you can do is not say to them, yeah, but, but they seem really good. Because this is a very common thing, you know, that you do to somebody who's been abused, but they seem really nice. Spiritual abuse is not only um, when somebody's alive. Spiritual abuse can, can continue upon one's death, which is another life experience. And this is what I say to people, especially if you're a revert to Islam like myself, to make sure you have a will in place. Because if you don't, then you could be buried. Um, your um, um, janazah prayer or your funeral prayer could be um, uh, done by members of your own birth family 
as a non-Muslim as well. And it's important for people that even when they're joining a new community, not to be naive, not to go in there and think everybody's your friend, everybody loves you. You know what I'm saying? Everyone's about God. Because no, because there's also people that are there that are manipulators. I was wondering, even like my Sheikh, like Imam Sheikh, the Daddy C say, Allah bless him. One of the things I noticed when he travels, they travel with a Jamaat. And then most of the times he brings his wife with him. Measure everything by Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He's our measuring stick. If you measure everything by Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, then you're in a good way. And measure in every situation, not one situation. I said in situation, uh, uh, giving lectures is actually the worst situation. Assume everyone is the average person and just don't let religious position make you trust them more than you would trust any other average person. None of those people are going to ensure your safety. You need to ensure your own safety. And it's incredibly naive to think that other people will do that for you. Now, that is a spirit we should all work to have because there are going to be vulnerable people who just can't understand certain abuse. They won't be able to stand up for themselves. They'll be pub publicly humiliated. And I always say there's no public humiliation without public consent. So we have to not allow a person to be publicly humiliated. We should stop somebody doing that and say, don't talk to this person in that way. One common tactic would be for money. Like I had to in the Quran. Allah says, when you have transactions, like write them down. Right? And then what people will do, like the Shaykh will say, oh, just give me the money. Oh, but shouldn't we write it down? Shouldn't we have it? You don't trust me. And then they guilt that person as if they're calling that person a liar, the Shaykh a liar. And what needs to be said is that no i'm just following protocol this is my protocol for everybody and then you have to also be the kind of person who if you lend money to somebody have the assertiveness to ask for it back realize it's your huck and if you're shy to ask for your money back you should never lend it out to anybody as this video reaches an end i wanted to reset our intentions with this video we wanted people who found themselves in similar situations to know that first of all they're not alone and second, that it is important for all of us to speak up. We all want a community we can be proud of. And consequently, we want the people in position of authority to be the best examples possible. So thank you for watching and let's all together watch out for the most vulnerable among us. Salaam Alaikum.